Thanks everyone for coming out tonight. My name is Mike Heine. I do the public relations and marketing for the Delvin Marion School District. Uh, we are a host site for this event. Uh, I'd like to thank our officials from Lower County uh, who came out to, to host this and for all of you for coming out to watch and listen and learn today. Uh, when Katie Bell from Lower County, is it drug court, treatment court? Drug treatment court? All the above. All the above. Uh, when, when she came to us about this idea, I was excited and I was nervous. I was excited because um, in my past life, I was a reporter for the James Book Gazette, and I covered Mulworth County, and I recall writing about three or four heroin deaths, actually, uh, and, and subsequent charges that were uh, Len Bias laws. Uh, Len Bias, is, uh, you may or may not know, is uh, a basketball player who had passed away from a drug overdose, and the uh, individual who supplied the drugs was uh, charged uh, in that death. So uh, they're pretty big stories. They're Fortunately, they're pretty rare for our county, but uh, it was kind of a growing issue back then, and that was five or six years ago now, uh, maybe a little bit more. Uh, and it's sad to see that it hasn't actually gone away. It's actually grown a little bit. So that's why we're here tonight. I, I was nervous about it in that I'm a PR director for a school district, and I didn't want people thinking, oh my gosh, Delvin has a problem with, with heroin. Um, I don't know that we do or not. I've never seen it be used. I don't know of any kids who have been expelled for use of heroin, but I'm sure um, in Delvin there's probably been a user of it, whether it be a uh, direct heroin uh, uh, syringe form or, or pills. And I'm sure that that's happened in other high schools too, Elkhorn, uh, Williams Bay, Lake Geneva, Whitewater, East Troy. Um, no one's really new to this problem. And uh, I'm excited that we're here to learn about it more tonight. Um, it, it's, a, it's a problem that needs to go away and hopefully we, we all become more educated about it and, uh, and, and help solve it together. So. I'm going to turn it over to Dan Nacy, right? Did I say it right? He's our district attorney for Orr County, and, and he's kind of spearheading this along with Katie Bell. And uh, I'm going to turn it over for his remarks. And again, thank you all for coming and enjoying it. Right? Good evening, everyone. First, I want to thank the folks at Delavan Darien High School for allowing us the opportunity to hold this event here tonight. And I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. I also want to warn you that tonight's going to be one of those hard conversations no one really wants to have. So I'll kick it off. Heroin has become a scourge upon our community. And I don't say that to terrify you or unnecessarily uh, scare you with any sort of personal or professional agenda. I say it because I, along with others in and around our criminal justice system, all across our county, our state, and our nation, are bearing witness on a daily basis to this growing threat. You know, maybe in the old days, heroin was something reserved for dropouts and rock stars, but no longer. Heroin's found its way into our quiet communities, into our rural, suburban, and urban areas, into our rich and poor neighborhoods, and into our schools. Although the predominant user is a white male aged 21 to 35, Heroin and opiate addiction crosses all geographic, age-related, and socioeconomic lines. Heroin has become three times more potent at 25% the cost over the last 30 years, and as a direct result of the increased demand, drug trafficking organizations are seizing the moment to supply our country with the heroin we want more than ever. But we can't have a real talk about heroin without talking about opiates all opiates, even the ones that are prescribed. Drugs like oxycontin, oxycodone, hydrocodone, Vicodin, morphine, pain medications that were a godsend to patients and to healthcare costs when invented. The unintended consequences are that the United States Drug Enforcement Administration now says that at least 26% of new heroin users are those who switched over from the recreational use of controlled prescription opiates. I wasn't always district attorney. In my time as a private legal practitioner, I had heroin addicted clients. Some longtime users, some brand new and young. People with bright futures from right here in Walworth County. I once had a client who was a roofer. He'd never done a drug in his life. Fell off a roof, hurt his back. Was prescribed pain pills. Got addicted. The doctor cut him off. And he went doctor shopping because he's addicted. Then he went to his parents' checkbook. Then he went to the street where pills are sold at a tremendous markup. And then because he's not Brett Favre, 
or Rush Limbaugh with unlimited funds for treatment, he switched to heroin because it's cheaper and more readily available than the prescription opiates and operates neurochemically in a nearly identical fashion. Then he stole from clients of a family member's cleaning company. Then he got caught, then he got sentenced to prison time, and then, and I'm not making this up, he thanked the judge for sending him to prison. But isolating addicts is not an effective answer. A young woman prosecuted by our office in 2009 was released from a three-year prison sentence in 2012, only to be found dead of an opiate overdose less than six months later. This problem exists in our community, and it's not visible. We don't have a bad part of town. We have our addicts right down the street from you and I. And even if we don't directly feel the impact, we feel as the community in other ways. Opiate addiction affects children through neglect, psychologically and by placing them in dangerous situations. It affects our bottom line as we as a community are forced to support addicts indefinitely through various public assistance programs at costs, or God forbid, become the victims of addiction-related crimes like burglaries. And that's why we as a community must meet this challenge head on, and I know that we can. I see this as a three-pronged approach. First, we educate our community. That's why we're here tonight. Tell your neighbors what you hear. Invite them to seek information. Set up a time to have someone speak at your next club or organizational meeting. Next, enforcement. I can tell you unequivocally that we have a spectacular, dedicated, tough group of narcotics officers here in Walworth County that I am truly proud I get the opportunity to work with and I can say are without question taking heroin and heroin dealers off our streets. Support them and support those who surround us by remaining vigilant and reporting concerns. And finally, through treatment. Our community is full of desperate users, the vast majority of which don't really want to be users anymore. They're not having fun anymore. We must treat all we can and return them to the fold of our community, as the only other option isn't really an option. It's been tried and it's failed. Tonight, You'll hear about what's currently happening in Walworth County. You'll hear from some parents who lost a son to addiction, from past users struggling to remain clean, from drug officers who have seen and fought the damage, from families who are healing, and from people who treat our addicts. Folks, like I said, this is a hard conversation, but it's one that is vital to our community. And I say this not as a prosecutor, but as a fellow citizen who loves Walworth County and a parent who loves his kids. This is a fight we can win, a fight we must win, and a fight we must engage in together. Now first, I'd like to ask on the stage Kim and Jamie Kruger, who will share with us their experiences of losing a son to heroin addiction. started using heroin. We noticed he had become quite withdrawn. We noticed that he had lost many of his friends and thought it was really strange because Cody had so many friends and everybody just, he, he loved all his friends. He, he got along great with everybody. Then we noticed signs of some deep depression and that was very strange for Cody. He was never depressed. And then we started noticing large amounts of money missing and to find out that he had been stealing from our bank accounts, our wallets, my purse, um, anything, anything he could do to steal money to get heroin is what he did. Uh, Cody was very upfront with us about his addiction. We tried many ways, many different approaches to help him battle 
this addiction. Um, these approaches include counseling, anti-addiction medication, inpatient rehab, um, naltrexone shots he tried, he went to a rehab in Arizona, nothing worked. He, Cody didn't want to stop, he just didn't want to stop. He went to a party one night. This is how Cody got started on heroin. He went to a party one time, one party. He was having trouble with his girlfriend. He went to the party and he was offered heroin. Well, let me tell you, it was all downhill from that night. Cody was addicted. It took one time for that boy to get addicted to heroin. And he snorted it at first. He told us everything. He snorted it at first and then eventually started shooting it because they get higher quicker when they shoot it. This went on for two years. Believe me, we tried everything to help him and nothing, nothing would work. Um, he, the naltrexone shots, that's a really good thing to do for heroin users. Um, very, very expensive, but it, it was worth it. But Cody was trying to bypass the shot. We'd take him down, get the naltrexone shot, bring him home and he would shoot more heroin into his system to try to bypass this naltrexone shot. So basically we were killing him by giving him the shot. So we stopped the shot. It just, it wasn't working and I was afraid at that point that we were gonna lose him. And August 1st, 2011, I was the one to find my son deceased in his bed. I'm gonna spare everybody the detail, the horrible details, but I assure you, it's, it's nothing you ever want to experience. Um, this experience with heroin addi addiction has also changed my life forever. Cody meant the world to me. He was a big part of my life. Now, that part is gone. Um, there have been days that I don't, even wanna, I don't even wanna get out of bed and function because he's gone. My husband and I um, have recently adopted a four-year-old little boy that came from heroin addicted parents as well. We fostered him for two years. We we want to get in, we are in the foster system now through Walworth County and that's our mission is to help these kids. Hopefully get these kids back with their families. Um, that's, that's what we want to do, but we want to get the families as much help as we can and I think the drug court is doing an awesome job at that. And that's, that's about it. I mean, the parents out here, I just wanted, the first sign of, of this heroin is the withdrawals, loss of friends, the missing money, and the start of the heroin is they start with pot, and you think, oh, okay, little pot's okay. Well, no, it's not. Then they start taking these pills, crushing them, snorting them, and then you think, oh, okay, a couple pills aren't gonna hurt them. No, it will because that's not enough for these kids. They want to go to the bigger and better stuff, which is the heroin. So just watch for the warning signs. Um, there's so many of them, and I know you think your kids will never, never do this. I never thought my son would do it, not in a million years, but he did, and he's gone. For, you know, that's, that was the outcome of heroin use. So I'll let my husband take over a little bit. Okay, um, just a few things. I'm, a, I'm an alcoholic. Um, I know what it's like to fight an addiction. Um, a lot of the things we do have to do is, as parents, look at our children. If we smoke, chances are the kids are gonna smoke. Having a bad day at work, mom, dad, you pick up a six pack, go home, have a couple beers. Well, the kids see that. Okay, well, kids have a problem, maybe they're going to do that. And they're going to go down the road to something else. It's an easy escape. Um, I struggle every day. Um, after Cody passed away, I decided that um, I'd go out and get drunk again. I'd take care of that problem. Well, sure did, I ended up in jail again. Um, I paid my dues. Don't ever want to go there again. Um, I see some people in the audience that have been sober and uh, off the drugs for a long time. I think we should give them a hand. 
all the people that are in the drug court. I try to go to as much drug court as I can. Um, it's not easy for these people that are in the drug court. If we look at ourselves, what addictions do we have? It's maybe not drugs. Do you smoke? Do you like a Mountain Dew or coffee in the morning? Try to give it up for a month, whatever. Don't do the coffee every day. Take a month off. If food's your addiction, cut back on stuff. See how tough it is. Well, the heroin's 10 times worse than what you're gonna try to stop. And I guarantee you, make yourself accountable to somebody. I mean, if you fail, do it for 30 days. If you fail, you have to start from day one again. See how long it takes you to make the 30 days. Um, I miss my son dearly. Um, as my wife said, we're foster some children. Um, it fills the empty hole, but it doesn't replace what you've lost. That's all I've got to say. Otherwise, I'll just lose it here. You guys have a good night. Next, I'd like to ask uh, Cole McDonald to come up and speak. Cole is a uh, uh, former user who is three years sober. Hi. My name is Cole McDonald. Uh, I, uh, a little bit about myself, I came up in a really great family. Uh, never wanted or needed anything, whatever I wanted we had. Um, and everything went downhill. I didn't start using any drugs until my mom died when I was 18. She died, and then I started off smoking pot. We went from pot, cocaine, anything I could get my hands on to numb the pain I did. And then somebody gave us some prescription pills. And that's how it started. I started taking Vicodin, and Vicodin wasn't good enough, so I went to purchase it. Oxycontin, and eventually it was like, I was paying so much for Oxycontin, right? Why not just get heroin? Get 10 times the amount for the same price. And that's how it started. Um, before I knew it, I was robbing from anybody and everybody. It didn't matter if you were my family. I was working for my father at his business. He gave me his uh, signing checks for him for his business. And it didn't take long. In three years, I took almost $40,000 from him to support my habit. Um, I overdosed once, and that's how I got my felony charge. I had to go to rehab uh, per my PO. Um, and I was locked up before that, and that was the best thing that ever happened. Going to jail and her forcing me into rehab was the single best thing that's ever happened to me in my life. I went to rehab, went to a halfway house for about five months up in Green Bay, and I came back down here. Um, and it's a struggle every day. Every day I see stuff, um, whether it's an aluminum can sitting on the side of the road or walking to a bathroom and there's a sharps container. Everything I see is just, it's a struggle every day to not go get high. Um, but since I stopped using, I have a good job, I live on my own, pay my own bills, paying back my father, I have friends again, and it's just everything is 100% different now that I stopped using. And it's, I don't even know, like, my PO, she, she saved my life because if she wouldn't have done what she did, I would definitely be dead or locked up for a lot longer than my little jail time and probation that I got. And it's like the DA said, it's not poor communities, it's not like dirtbag people. Like I said, I came from a great family. Two loving parents over my life, my whole, in my life all the time. And it just spiraled out of control. There's nothing I could do about it. I wanted to stop using, but the drugs are always there. Right on your shoulder, talking into your ear, oh, one more time's not gonna hurt. One more time's not gonna hurt. Oh, and that's about it. I don't really have much more to say than that, but I appreciate you guys having me come talk for you guys. I hope everybody in the past is going through the drug court because I wish there was something like that when I was going through my cell because that wasn't even an option when I was doing mine. So.
Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Alex Control. She's also a recovering addict, and she is a participant in the Walworth County Drug Court.
So like Alex said, she is a participant in the Walker County Drug Court and she is doing phenomenal. It's really great. And also, as of today, you are a student at UWI. <laughs> That was half hard. Applaud again. All right, if you're anything like me, you've got an attention to detail, and you've been sitting here wondering why we're sitting at a Walworth County Heroin Summit, and it says Waukesha County Sheriff's Department up on the screen. Now, the reason is our next presenter is Detective Chris Cole. He is with the Waukesha County Sheriff's Office. He has been a narcotics officer for many, many years. He's also the president of the Wisconsin Narcotics Officers Association. He gives his presentation all over the state. He does a fantastic job. So we invited him here, as well as many of the issues are very similar. We give a warm welcome to Chris Cole. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Detective Chris Cole from Waukesha Sheriff. Um, all my slides are going to say Waukesha, but they can say Walworth County real easy. Um, we're just one step closer to the source in Waukesha. We have the same problems you guys do, we're the same type of people. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, I'm used to walking around, so I'm probably going to trip over this while you guys are going to laugh real hard. I got this new clicker here, so here we go. Who are the users? Many of us know the first time uh, people use drugs first time when they're teenagers. It's no secret. Um, people are experimenting, that kind of stuff. As parents, I have to tell you, you have to send a consistent message from the beginning and draw the line in the sand saying we're not going to accept it in this house. We're just not. From day one. You, you listen to some of the recovered addicts here, and I appreciate them coming and telling their stories. All of them have a little common theme. No one started using heroin. They all started using something else, like alcohol and weed. So we can't talk about heroin until we talk about alcohol and weed. Uh, drug trends. Drug trends, uh, all drugs are out there all the time. They just kind of come and go like, like fashion trends. Um, when I started narcotics 12 years ago, it was all cocaine. And then it turned into ecstasy. And now we're into opiates and heroin. Weed's always rough. Weed's always number one, especially the good weed. But those other drugs, they kind of come and go. You're not hearing anything about ecstasy anymore. And cocaine's still around, but you don't hear about it. All you hear about is heroin, heroin, heroin. We'll talk a little about why that is. Uh, mainstay drugs are different. The potency has changed. I graduated from my way to high school ages ago, in 1990. Um, back then, marijuana at a THC level would cost me 8 to 10%. Now, with the products of marijuana wax, up to 99% THC. That's a different drug than smoking over a weed. That's a totally different drug. Heroin back in the day, um, if you could find it, six to ten percent pure. Now they're up to be 70, 80, 90 percent pure. That's a different kind of heroin. It's a totally different drug than, our, than I, as a parent, um, uh, was used to it. Just, you know, I followed the Grateful Dead around for six months, never touched nothing. Um, I had a vision in my life, I wanted to be a cop, so it was really easy for me to say no. Not so easy for our kids nowadays. We'll talk a little bit about that later, too. You've heard this theme a little bit too, um, through our recovering eggs. It's just a little, it's no big deal. It is a big deal. It's not just a little. There's a little story, um, honors student out of Cumberland High School 2007. Uh, graduates with honors. She's a member of the tennis club, member of the debate team, goes to UWM. It's end of first semester, she's going to a party. She's drinking a little bit of alcohol. Um, she has a headache. So one of her girlfriends offers her one half of one pill, one half of one oxycodone, and she takes it. This is some scary stuff. But if you take oxycodone and opiate, you use alcohol, the brain tells the heart to shut down. So she goes to lay down, her friends still continue to party. She's sleeping, her friends are responsible people, so they're checking on her throughout the night, she's breathing. The problem is her heart is slowing down throughout the night. She used to work at 10 a.m., so her girlfriend goes to wake her up at 8 a.m. However, she's dead one half of one pill. Now, mom and dad, I know you know your kids aren't going to spike heroin. They'll tell you what, they'll drink a beer and they'll take one half of one oxycodone. 
they'll do it. And they'll do it without even thinking about it. The guy starts sending the message right away, drugs are not good. Parents ask me, when do you start talking to your kids? I start talking to my five-year-old little dude. And we don't have this big, deep conversation about drugs. You just say this, drugs are bad, man. You know that, right? That's daddy, that's all it takes. Because for the whole life, our kids are told drugs are okay, especially pills, especially prescription pills. Take this, it'll make you feel better. Our kids have an earache. Take this, please take this, honey. Honey, please take this. Take this, take this, take this. And you're shoving these drugs down their, down their throat. When I say that, it's for their own good because they have the ear infection, and you're putting them down. But what do they hear? Take this, it'll make you feel better. So subconsciously, they've heard that their whole life. Now when they're 13 years old, and Johnny's little girlfriend says, hey, try one of these pills, it'll make you feel better, what kicks in? Little mommy on the shoulder going, take this, it'll make you feel better. Not blaming mom and dad, but just the reality of what we all do it. And every parent in here has done it to their little angel. Come, on, please take this, honey. Please take this. So getting back to the theme, it's just a little, it's no big deal. It, everything's a big deal. From the alcohol to the weed, from day one, we don't, we don't accept that in this house. It's gotta be parents. It's gotta be parents. It can't be friends. I know I was talking about my soapbox telling you what to do, but some parents need to hear it. It really is true. And, it, and no matter what you do, sometimes you can't solve the problem. But at least you can tell yourself, hey, I gave the best fight I could from day one. In fact, our middle school parents will probably hear this message. Here we go. Drugs and around. High grade marijuana. All is around. Um, we see it a lot because it's the most prevalent uh, drug in America. Uh, with the pro marijuana lobby, does a fantastic job telling our kids to say a bad thing. But if you listen to the recovery addicts, I like forgot almost every one of them said, hey, I started smoking weed. Cocaine, crack cocaine, still around. Back in the 80s, crack cocaine made its, its big heyday. It's still around. It's just not as prevalent as heroin right now. Diverted pharmaceuticals, number one problem in this country. We go through too many pills, and the pills lead into number one problem, number two problem is heroin. Heroin's big right now. It's just like it cycled into it, and one of its things with heroin, with marijuana, it's psychologically addicting. Heroin, physically addicting as well as psychologically. You have to have it. I have to have it, I have to have it, I have to have to have to have it. No matter what. Club drugs, ecstasy still around, and here's a killer coming at us, methamphetamine, and it's making and it's making its comeback. It was big maybe six, seven years ago, I had a little bit of a surge, um, kind of fell off the planet, and now the cartel is sending it back up here. They make fantastic methamphetamine, and it's cheaper than ever. And obviously Wisconsin got up with alcohol, Especially in Wisconsin, can't go anywhere on a weekend in the summer and not have a beer, right? Church festivals, summer fest, state fair, just for Wisconsin culture. Obviously, alcohol is the first drug our kids experiment with. Um, as a result, Andre drinking is a leading public health problem for our youth in this country. Marijuana, again, we can't talk about heroin until we talk about weed, because almost everyone starts off with alcohol and weed. When the pro marijuana lobby told us, hey, this is a totally natural product, this doesn't hurt you. But the fact is, smoking it has adverse health effects. It impairs short term memory, slows down reaction, alters mood and judgment, decision making. Um, it, it's not, a, it's not a, a, an empowering drug. Marijuana is not addictive. Well, it is addictive. One in six people will get addicted to marijuana and move on to something else. That's the scary part. Most people aren't dying from a marijuana overdose. It happens, so I'll tell you about that later. Oh, we move on to something else. It's about addictive personality. Some of us have it, some of us not. One of the fathers said here, hey, your kids watch what you do. Guess what, my father's an alcoholic. My brother's a heroin junkie. Actually, so he's a recovering addict. He should call him a junkie, I apologize to him, he's not even here. He's a recovering addict, he's been clean since Thanksgiving. His brother is president of the Narcotics Association, and I can't keep my own brother clean. You see how this drug goes? It's bad. He started off smoking a little weed, worked his way up to the beginning. So again, marijuana, when your kid is not just a little weed, you find the weed at the house, you got a problem. You gotta start dipping in the bud, no pun intended, right away. It's very important. And not only that, but if you have an older child and you have younger children, they're watching what your oldest child is doing. It's a cycle that you don't want to get into. And it's not just it's not just our dirtball families, and I, I don't want to stereotype, but I talked with a family from the Your Choice program from Hartwood, Wisconsin. Upper middle class family, own their own business. Their son Tyler, age 15, 
full-blown heroin addict. At 18, he's living in a drug house in Milwaukee. He survived, but again, two loving parents, a successful late country family, it can happen to anyone. There's no, no, no uh, alcohol or drug abuse in that family until Tyler. So no matter what you do, sometimes your kid just falls off. So you gotta keep, keep, keep on it with this consistent message. This is fatalities involved with drug driving in Colorado, uh, reference to marijuana. Everyone says, you know, hey, it's legal in Colorado. In fact, uh, when I did this presentation this afternoon to the students, we opened up for questions. And the first question we hear is, should we legalize pot? The answer is absolutely not. Um, the, the governor of Colorado, the Democratic governor of Colorado, who originally pushed the legislation, now just said it's the worst decision he's ever made in the state of Colorado to legalize marijuana. A couple years ago, I took my wife out there to Denver um, for Valentine's Day. Say, why do you go to Denver? Because we had frequent fly miles on Midwest, we turn on the frontier, and the frontier only flew out to Denver. So we went out to Denver, which is a nice city. Stayed at the Crown Plaza downtown, except for all these homeless people in downtown Denver. I asked the dude, uh, um, I say the dude, the concierge, uh, hey, a homeless guy outside the front, you're going to call the cops? No, yeah, he just lives there. Well, you're going to call the cops to shake him around? No, they ain't going to come. It's just, it's, since we realize marijuana, all these people, they just come live downtown. Really? Right outside the Crown Plaza? Getting back to this statistic, um, 2011, the, the, the stats are a couple years old. 13%, look at the increase in 2006 to 2011, that's marijuana only the, the, um, the bottom line. The top line, 23.7%, that's all drug fatalities in uh, Colorado. Colorado said, hey, we're gonna uh, legalize marijuana, we'll tax it, we're gonna gain $300 million, not, not $30 million. But the cost of society, all these fatalities, um, has it become a wash. In fact, it's costing uh, the government more than it's, it's bringing in. What does marijuana cost? My dad's $1,200 a quarter pound. So if your kid has four ounces of good weed, this is good marijuana, it's 1200 bucks. The problem with high, health, high dollar items, you get guns. Drug dealers carry guns. Waukesha hates when I say this. This is from the Walmart in Waukesha. It's a fully medic Uzi with a, with a silencer. That's a bad gun. I usually say a badass gun. No, I did. Badass gun. Um, marijuana. Everyone loves each other. There's no violence. Here's a non. This is a non-violent. No victim here. Unless you're the dude carrying that gun, because no one's going to steal his weed from him. You owe him twelve hundred bucks, or five thousand dollars for buying a pound of weed, four thousand dollars for a pound of weed. When you have high-dollar items like narcotics, the drug dealers carry guns. And they're not highly trained to use them. They, they don't have a CCW. Other thing with the legalization of marijuana, there's other been byproducts that are coming out of Colorado and, and Washington. Um, the number one thing is weed candy. Weed candy is extremely dangerous, not regulated. You don't know how much THC is in it. Uh, Colorado has seen a huge, huge spike in ER visits from young children eating marijuana candy. Um, it comes in like big Wonka chocolate bars. You're supposed to eat one square is one dose. Three and a half a chocolate bar and an OD. And actually, you know, last year, a young kid died eating marijuana candy. So you can't OD from marijuana. MDMA ecstasy. Don't see it a lot anymore. It's still around. Um, it used to come in pills. Now you see the powder form. Um, still there. It's just that progression, working our way up the spectrum to heroin. This was uh, bought out on the internet off the Silk Road back in the day, about three years ago in the city of Brookfield. Brookfield hates when I say that too. Um, kid bought 20 grand worth of, of uh, uh, MDMA off the internet, having fed FedEx to the house. How about that? Did you ever think that would happen? It scares the heck out of you. And he didn't want to pay 20 grand for it, so he was going to make it himself now. So he started ordering the supplies to, to make it in his mom's basement. Um, in addition, he had in his basement, he had a 12 plant or a, an eight plant marijuana grow. Each plant was about five feet high. Um, he constructed a grow in his mother's basement and he had vented it through the roof of the house. His mother said to me, what was I supposed to do? His father's not wrong. He said, uh, I don't know. Tell him, hey, you can't build a grow room in the basement. Get it out of my house or I'm gonna call the cops. 
I understand you can't watch what your kids do 24 seven. Here's a little parenting advice from me to you. If they start constructing a marijuana grow in the basement and venting through the roof of your two story house, you gotta be, you gotta parent that one. Because I can't help you if you don't say no. Um, oh, manufacturing MDMA, it's a lot like manufacturing methamphetamine, it's extremely volatile, and he probably would have blown the house up. So, lucky we got this one. Over to prescription drugs. Prescription drugs like oxycodone, oxycodone, oxycontin, Vicodin, all that is is prescription grade heroin. It's the same drug. Oxycodone equals heroin. And here's some of the recovery addicts talk about it. I was taking pills are too expensive. How much do they cost? Well, I won't get to that second. Second highest threat in the region. The reason it's not the highest threat is heroin kills really fast. Pills takes a little bit longer. More Americans abuse prescription drugs than hallucinogens, cocaine, heroin, and inhalants combined. How about that? Should you see that stat tonight? Here's the threats to our kids. They're not afraid of these pills. Like I said earlier, we've taught them their whole life, take this, it'll make you feel better. They think the drugs are safe, they're medicine. You gotta tell our kids, you have the sex talk with them, you have the alcohol talk with them, you gotta have the pill talk saying, pills are not safe, don't take them. Don't share pills. If the doctor prescribes me a 230, well, 270 pound dude, um, some medication, I can't give it to my 37 pound princess that's two years old. No, I, because I didn't go to medical school, the doctor gave it to me. So don't share pills, it's real bad. Um, the other thing, kids don't think these drugs are addictive. If you take an opiate, like oxycodone, oxycodone, Vicodin, in less than two weeks, your brain can become adult or addicted forever. When we talk about the recovery addicts, even the ones that went to prison, um, if your brain is going to chemically altered by an opiate, even after 15 years of being clean, you have a 25% chance of falling back in the game. You're an addict forever. That's scary. You're scary too. And you say, well, why do we have these pills? They're fantastic medicine. If you're injured, they're great. They work real well. In 2008, I had a motorcycle accident. Cracked some ribs, broke some ribs. I get the oxycodone. I'm a narcotics officer. I'm afraid to take the damn pill. So I don't take it during the day. I suffer through the pain. I take it at night to sleep. Try to get off in less than 30 days. I mean, again, I was only taking it half the time. Deathly afraid of this pill. Um, but again, general public doesn't realize that. My father, God bless his soul, he's 75 years old, has a neurop neuropathy in his feet. And so he tells me we're out to lunch with the family, his feet hurt. He's gonna go home and take one of these oxy. I think your mother saw some oxycodone pills from when she had her surgery. I said, no, you can't take that, Daddy. It's not, why? It's just a pain pill. No, 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 don't take it. Because my old man, he'd wash it down with the Miller Lite, you know? <laughs> That's reality. I'm speaking from my heart here, right? My father's not a junkie. He likes his beer. But he'd take that pill with that Miller Lite. We talked about that earlier. What happens with oxycodone and alcohol? Real bad combination. There's an interesting stash out of Waukesha County, and I'm sure Walworth can similar. Back in 2012, we had more opiate deaths and traffic deaths in Waukesha County. We have two major interstates running through us. You know, we have 43, the Rock Freeway, we have I-94. More opiate deaths than traffic deaths. How about that? That's valued up in the upper right-hand corner there. Um, is that scary looking pill to you? You think your 14 year old girl is afraid to take that? That beautiful value with heart in the middle? Don't say, oh, this is bad, please don't take me. It looks delicious, doesn't it? But that's oxycodone on the bottom corner. They're not afraid to take it. There's no needle next to that, that oxycodone, but it's just like a heroin. It's just, it's the same pill, the same opiate. More overdose related deaths uh, in this country than heroin. But you think you'd see that one either. Again, we can't talk about heroin, we talk about weed and pills. So dangerous. We talked to, uh, again, oxycodone, Vicodin, all they are is heroin. Number one sign that someone will use heroin is they're abusing painkillers. And you heard it from recovering addicts. I was taking pills, and someone told me to switch over to heroin because it's cheaper. Oxycodone, oxycodone, costs one dollar a milligram. Um, so a 30, and now, um, Purdue Pharma has put some safeguards in it, so they want the 30 milligram pills. One 30 milligram pill is 30 bucks. 
when you ask how many pills um, they're using, I, had, uh, I speak with a recovering addict named Connor. He was using 150 pills in three days to maintain. Tulsa Hero was 20 bucks. See why they switch? Pound different sweet pills and heroin. Pills have a little number on it tells you how much you're taking. Taking 30 milligrams, you don't have much to take. Street heroin, you don't know what the dosage is, you don't know what the purity. It's not made in a lab. Here we are. We're born drug threat in Walworth, Waukesha County is heroin. Killing. I mean, we have many more overdose deaths. I think you guys in Walworth County, we're just one step closer to the source that's coming out to you. Record number of overdoses. That's what it looks like. Come to these little silver foil folds, or come to little gem bags um, with some little stamps on, like orange basketballs or black spades. All those little gem bags are marketing tools because the junkies talk and they say, hey, the black spades are good, the orange basketballs are good. Um, so that's why they put it in those little gem bags. Heroin can be injected, inhaled, um, uh, and uh, snorted and smoked. Back in 1970, when heroin was 7% pure, you couldn't sniff it. You had to be injected. Now that the, the cartel has increased the purity, it can be sniffed or snorted. People have this idea in their head that if I'm snorting it or sniffing it, I'm not addicted. It's not as addictive if I snort it. I'm not a junkie, then I'm not sticking myself with a needle. It's just as addictive. People that have crossed the line, drug seeking, uh, drug seeking uh, consequences, no, drug seeking no matter what the consequences. I have to have it, I have to have it, I have to have it no matter what. Their brains are chemically altered, they physically need it, they emotionally need it. Average age, average user is told 49, 22.1 years is the medium age. We talked a little bit about that earlier, why is that? Because they work the way into the big end. No one starts off spiking heroin. They start off with alcohol, weed, and progress their way up the system. So when we talk to the high schools, the high school uh, secretaries and teachers and guidance counselors say, there's no heroin in my school. No, but they're taking pills and they're smoking weed and they're one step away from the next thing. So at all of county, you may have one or two students using heroin at this age. But 19, 20, 21, most of the recovering addicts, how old were they when they started using? 19 years old, right out of high school. That's pretty close to high school age to me. Do we talk about recreation with the mentality and sniffing it? One thing about heroin, you also really just meet bad people and you die. It's just that simple. The heroin dealers in the city, in Milwaukee, don't care. They don't care about their, their, their customers' lives. In fact, they'll, they'll call, if they don't see, when you're in hooked on heroin, you see your dealer every day. Every day, you need 100 bucks to survive. You're buying five $20 bags to survive every day. So you'll see them every day of, of the week. You don't take Easter off, you don't take Mother's Day off, you don't take Christmas Day off. You go see your guy. And if you don't go see your guy for a day or two, he calls you and asks where you're at. Because he really cares about you. And you say, hey, I'm in rehab. He said, man, I got some good shit, man. Come on, I'll hook you up. Oh, man, I'm trying to get clean. Oh, man, come on, I'll hook you up. Free. Happens all the time. That's what $100 of the heroin looks like next to a penny. Heroin addicts are extremely good about lying and concealing. The reason is, is the drug makes it easy to do, easy to conceal that. If you had a big old marijuana block, it's hard to hide that from mom and dad. Those little five little pieces of foil, impossible to find if you're mom and dad. One thing, we'll talk about signs later, but if you have young kids, and they're selling important stuff in their life, like important stuff, I mean like their Xbox or their PlayStation, stuff that's really important to them, you got a problem. So if they sell their Xbox, you're in trouble. The other thing my mom told me this, and I'll pass it on to you before I forget, if you find your, you know how many spoons in the house, you can't find any spoons, you got a problem. Because you take the spoons and they're cooking the heroin in it. And I never thought about that before, because I'm just a cop, I'm not that smart, I'm just a dude. And now that, but I'm a dude cop, so I'm just a guy. So I'm not even that smart. Um, but mom told me I can't have any spoons in the house, you know, spoons. Danger with heroin. 
talk a little bit about it. We take a pillion oil, there's a number on it, tells you how much it is. Heroin, from anywhere from 7 to 90% pure. When you're at it, you take as much heroin as you can to get high without ODing. That's your goal. You get as high as you can without ODing. So if you used to take 20%, and now you go and the dealer's upped it, and now you're taking 40% with OD. It happens real quick. You can't save yourself. You inject yourself, and you fade away. You don't die, the heart starts to slow down. And no one's there to administer. You can't administer the Narcan to yourself. It doesn't work that way. You'll see it like they think they can. They'll have their Narcan needle all loaded up next to them. They'll take the heroin. But the fact is the body tells you it doesn't work that way. You fade away, you can't save yourself. Someone's got to inject it into you. The other thing about you're going to get in trouble with bad people, the guys that sell heroin carry guns. This is out of Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. You guys know Oconomowoc, that's where all the rich people live in Longshot County. This is, when I showed this to the parents in Oconomowoc, I spoke to Oconomowoc parents twice because they had a bunch of kids die out there. When I speak to Oconomowoc high, uh, high school parents, I did two nights last year, 450 people each night sold out because the kids are dying in Oconomowoc. Tell you what, if you had a kid in Delvin die um, last week, this place would be packed full of parents. We don't want to get there. So as responsible parents as you are, you have to want to tell all these people that are too busy to come tonight, hey, you better get your head out of the sand. You need to learn more about drugs than your kids know. Let me tell you, they know a lot more than you ever did. The reason is every one of your kids has a damn cell phone. They can Google any one of these things. Try this when you're sitting at home at night watching the news. Try to Google how to use heroin, and boom, a YouTube video comes up. How, how do you grow marijuana? Boom, video comes up. We didn't have that knowledge back in 1990 when I was in high school. I had our damn book from Amsterdam how to grow weed. <laughs> right? When I was in college, I thought I was kick dealing because I had a star writer, word processor. Woohoo! Didn't have computers. You know, I graduated my senior year, we got an email address. I'm like, this is crazy. This internet thing's a fad. Um, yeah, just a dude, not that smart. That's what I'm $1,000 in the heroin website like. comes in. A, um, so about Commonwealth, Wisconsin again. Comes a one cigarette pack. That was out at the dealer's house. More guns, 70,000 US currency. Uh, this gentleman, he was a senior citizen. He was in um, government housing, the, the, the federal Title IX housing, whatever they call it, Title V. Um, and he was paid a dollar thirty-seven for his oxycodone prescriptions because as taxpayers we were um, supplementing his drug dealing. And he's selling his scripts to the kids. Here's what bad when I took his money. This was his retirement fund. Warning signs for parents. I told you about the spoons already. Um, if your kid starts going down the path, you're going to kind of know it as responsible parents. Um, but the change is kind of gradual. It doesn't happen overnight. It's kind of like losing weight. You, know, you can't just run one marathon and just all come off. Let me tell you, I've tried. Um, but it's gradual change. And I didn't get this way overnight either. Kind of a skinny dude in high school as a diving team. Kind of worked my way up this way. Changes in your kids are the same way. The way you'll see it is if your brother or sister, aunt and uncle, come see your niece or nephew and go, hey, your kid was messed up, dude. What? No, I'm telling you, something's not right. Don't be afraid to say something. You know, Ralph, it'll be correct, we don't want to offend anyone. Hey, yeah, if it keeps the kid alive, you gotta just open your mouth and say, hey, your kid looks like crap. There's something wrong. Hopefully that parent's wise enough to go, well, I never really didn't notice. Let's just start seeing this stuff. Uncuffed appearance, I mean this is like all teenagers, but nevertheless. Uncuffed appearance, missing cash or valuables, change of performance, bad grades, drug paraphernalia, lethargic. If you're talking to them, I know it's hard because they're teenagers, but if they just start falling asleep on you, you got a problem. And I'm not talking about the first thing, they're just, they're nodding away in the middle of the day. That's a sure sign of drug, especially opiates. Um, if they start selling their stuff, that's a big sign. They'll lie, they'll lie, they'll lie, they'll change their friends. The BFF from sixth grade on, they won't hang out with them anymore. They won't be involved in sports. They're a big football player, now they're not into it anymore, that kind of stuff. And you think, oh, he's just a teenager, he's just experimenting, he's just growing up, it's no big deal. It's a big deal. Because things happen in certain progressions. Withdrawals, same friends, eyes look lost, they're far away luck, uh, sword speech. No interest in future plans. That's a good one too. Um, you have these plans to go to UB Madison, play football, and become a pharmacist. 
And now I don't care. I didn't want to go work at McDonald's. At that time, I didn't go to work. I'm just gonna, we're, we're, we're working, working for fools, working for people that are, ch are chasing the dollar, materialistic, because my brother told me this, you guys are too materialistic. I was just living on the east side with all the other adult smoking people on the east side. You guys are too materialistic. All you guys chase the dollar. You, you and my wife, Andrea, Andy, you guys work too hard. And then, like a month later, hey, can I borrow 500 bucks? So, if they start telling you stuff like that, um, they'll have lost their, their goals, especially if you're, you have a good kid and they have goals on their mind, you got a problem. Cocaine's okay, still around. Um, 8,180 bucks, that's what it looks like. GHB, am I doing on time? Right. GHB, parents, this is some scary stuff. GHB is the date rape drug. It's odorless, it's tasteless. You don't see it too much in high school, but the freshman year of college, you'll see it. Very underreported. We never hear about this in college. But it's one of the biggest problems in college campuses. Colleges don't tell you that when you're recruiting. What happens is, is as a young man drops us in, in a little young lady's drink, she takes it, and she um, loses consciousness for the next six to eight hours. Does whatever she wants with it. She wakes up, she's been sexually assaulted, figures, I have no lot of experience with alcohol, I must have got drunk, I must have wanted it. She never calls the cops, never. How about this scary thought? For our little dudes in here, this happens to a dude in college, he's sexually assaulted, he never calls the cops. He never tells anyone, ever. Ever. Because dudes never tell anyone something like that happens to him. So it never gets reported. Um, this can be made with a simple uh, senior college or senior chemistry education. Or if you're not, if you're into that long chemistry, just pull all your smartphone out and say, how do I make GHB? It tells you how to do it. Methamphetamine. We have this stupid law, and it costs too little, but it's probably, it's probably unfair. Um, that you have to show your driver's license to get cold medicine now. That was supposed to stop the, the, the drug labs, meth labs in the United States. Um, and it probably helped a little bit, but the major help was the cartels. The cartels figured, hey, Americans want methamphetamine, we're going to provide it to them. They can buy 55 gallon drums from Asia, a pure federal. They make fantastic methamphetamine. The quality of the product went up, the price went down. Cartels had the shipping routes and already for cocaine, marijuana, and heroin. They throw the meth on the truck and up it comes to the United States. Just that simple. Um, people use methamphetamine, extremely paranoid. Um, they're up for days at a time. They're called tweakers. They keep hitting the pipe, hitting the pipe, hitting the pipe. They also smoke it. Um, and they're real paranoid. Um, they get superhuman strength. So you'll see the stories about how the cops, they can't take, they get five or six cops trying to arrest this guy and he's throwing around like rag dolls, um, high on something like this. Here's a case in Milwaukee a couple years ago. Um, dude thought the cops were watching him. He ripped his car apart. Um, when I say ripped it apart, he pulled the dash out, the seats off, um, the whole thing. Um, we were watching him. We had a little um, GPS underneath the bumper of the car. So it wasn't too paranoid because we were watching him. Um, that being said, extremely dangerous. It's probably coming this way. I was talking with the Walworth County guy this afternoon. He said they're seeing a little bit more and more of this in Walworth County. Faces of meth, this is a progression of what meth does to the human body. It's an extremely um, volatile drug. It's made with a bunch of nasty chemicals. What happens is when we take this drug, um, the body wants to get rid of the chemicals extremely as fast as possible. So it starts excreting it through the skin, and they get what's called meth bugs. And they start picking the skin, because the toxins are coming through the skin, and they pick the skin right off the face. Remember the pearl right on top of it, so I think there's just bug underneath your skin, and they keep picking and picking and picking and picking and picking. And that's what you end up looking like. Um, another thing about methamphetamine, and I just lost my train of thought. So we'll skip that very important point. Methamphetamine, methamphetamine. Um, sorry, I lost it. K2, spice, synthetic marijuana. Um, about four years ago, the DEA did a fantastic job in Wisconsin. I was with them at the time um, to sweep, to clear this out of the area. We run on a lock shot colony. Walworth did a big sweep, went through every retailer in the county and um, got rid of this kind of stuff. Um, people think synthetic marijuana is legal. It is illegal. It is a chemical put, put up some, some dahlia leaves. Um, it's a nasty high. It makes you paranoid. About uh, six years ago, um, if you guys remember, Walworth, Waukesha County, a um, young man drove his car into the, uh, on the Rock Freeway, drove his car to pick up into a tow truck in the middle of the night. He, he was high on spice, all paranoid. Killed himself. 
Don't see it too much anymore. However, it's still um, in the city, in Milwaukee, and you'll see a lot of Madison in the head shops, but it's illegal. So if your kid tells you, hey, this is a legal product, um, look, mom, it says not intended for human consumption on the package, it means they're smoking it because no one buys their, their potpourri in a package that looks like that. And I'll have goofy names like uh, 420, something related to marijuana type a reference, you know, Mary Jane, pull your mind, that kind of stuff. It doesn't say like, like a pumpkin spice on it or sweet apple pie, you know, nothing like that. Synthetic cannabinoids, bath salts, don't see a lot of it around, but it's a synthetic PCP, um, also very illegal. Um, again, I don't see too much of it, but I thought I'd just throw it up there for you. If you find yourself in trouble, when I see yourself, probably your kids, these are some of the resources you can use. Dial 211, Addiction Resource Council, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Pro Health Care Assessment Referral, Ottawa, Waukesha, Rogers Memorial, Waukesha. The Rosecrans people are fantastic. Um, I've done talks for a couple years now, and Rosecrans has always been a big supporter of these heroin summits. Addiction Resource Council again, Waukesha Drug Free Communities, um, great a resource for information. Now, and your choice to live. Um, your choice was out here last year, but it came last year. Fantastic organization, that's the family I was telling you about who lives in Harland, whose son survived the heroin epidemic, the heroin. Um, they've dedicated their life to educating young people. They do a fantastic job. Their website um, has a lot of information on it as well. Any questions? I normally don't take questions, um, but because it's a nice control group and you didn't laugh at my jokes that much, I'll take a couple. Anyone? Way in back, please. So when you are dealing with young children and you and they are sick and you do want to give them medicine, what do you say to them? I don't know. That sounds funny. Here's what I say to my little princess. Please take this, honey. Please take this. Please take this. Please take this. Um, however, with my five-year-old little dude, we've had to talk about drugs now already. And again, we've had to talk. It's not, it's not just once a year. I tell them maybe once a month, every couple of weeks, just to pass it. Drugs are bad, drugs are, I'm trying to, and I don't know, I'm just making this crap up, okay? I don't know if it's working or not, because he's only seven. I'll tell you when he's 20 if it worked, um, but I figure if I'm, I'm trying to counteract um, the mantra that's been put in his head, by putting a different mantra in his head, saying drugs are bad, drugs are bad, drugs are bad. I think my seven-year-old dude's gonna be fine. It's my two-year-old princess that's sucking the life out of me because um, she's a seven-year-old brother and uh, she has no fear. So that's the one I'm more worried about. Um, yeah, I get the kids to take the medication, so whatever works, as a parent, whatever works, I guess. Actually, you know what I'd say? I'd say, Andrea, can you give the medication to the little girl? Let her do it. Because um, I'm just a dude, I'm not that smart. Um, but I would just counteract the message as they get older with the positive message of drugs are bad, drugs are bad. Remember parents too, I forgot to mention this, have the sex talk, have the drug talk, have the marijuana talk, have the pill talk, have the drunk driving talk. Um, also, count your pills. Um, I didn't have a lot of time tonight, but last year in Washtenaw County, we collected 12,000 pills for disposal. 12,000 pounds of pills. That's a lot of little pills. Build up a semi-truck full of pills because we're over-medicated. And we're really good about working our liquor bottles. And no one counts the pills coming out of the pharmacy. So you don't know if it really gave you 90 of them. And sometimes we don't take them all because their take is needed, especially pain pills. You don't know how many are in the bottom. Especially if you have preteens, you know, 12, 13, in fact, you know, I think middle school parents should be here. But 12, 13, 14 year olds, that's where we're starting to experiment with pills a little bit. Couch your pills, keep them locked up. It's important. You got a parent to a trust but verify. Well, uh, here's my parent advice too. If you have a, a sassy kid, doesn't want to listen, take the, the, the door off their um, the room. That, that'll, uh, that takes their privacy away real quick and humbles them a little bit. Um, don't, don't, none of this crap either. Of, I won't try to give my kid privacy, respect their space, all that stuff. Not nah, check their Facebook, you check their phone, you search their room. You know why? Because you're paying the bills. It's your house, your rules. It sounds real simple, but I have all these smart lawyers and attorneys. Sorry, Ian and doctors and pharmacists out in Waukesha County who are afraid to go tell their kids what to do. Are afraid to go in their rooms. 
we got to. So I got on my soapbox, but I'm real passionate about this. Um, so any other questions? Thanks for listening. talk about is the truth. I don't say it to scare you or be overly dramatic. I do it to be honest. I'm going to try not to swear. I have no PowerPoint, uh, just these sheets of paper with a uh, stream of consciousness on them. <coughs> I buy heroin. I bought it regularly for I buy it in doves for 20 bucks each, half a gram for 60, holes for 120. Sometimes I can get two for 200. Sometimes I get five uh, or more if I can get enough money together. It's best when it's a uh, chip off the block and raw. A lot of the time though, they step on it with dorm or other garbage to spread it out. Sometimes they cut it with fentanyl, uh, that's wild. Uh, over the past uh, couple of years, my friends and I have bought more than a few zips, that's um, ounces of heroin in total, maybe up to a key or two, uh, that's a kilogram, it's a thousand pounds. I bought heroin down the block from your house. I bought it in your church parking lot. Bought it next to you um, in the parking lot while you're loading your groceries. I bought it next to your kid's school. But the truth is, I buy heroin because I hate it. I buy it because it's destroying our community and killing our kids. I work for the Walworth County Drug Enforcement Unit. I'm a narcotics officer. I work with a dedicated team of individuals who build drug cases against users, dealers, and suppliers. We buy everything. We don't discriminate. We buy weed, pills, cocaine, meth, and heroin. We take in drug tips from the community, people like you. We work with confidential informants. We buy drugs directly ourselves from dealers. We arrest those who use and those who sell. Sometimes those we arrest get the opportunity to go to a drug court to try and turn their lives around. I want to speak for our unit. We are huge advocates of the drug court. I think it's awesome and it's been a long time coming. Sometimes with the help of the DA's office, we send dealers to prison for lengthy sentences. It doesn't matter what you look like, where you come from, you don't have to look like I look to buy it. Maybe next week I will shave this patchy beard, get a new haircut, pick a new street name, and buy it in a shirt and tie out of a local business here in Delaware. Dealers don't care who's buying it as long as the money is steady. They love kids from Walworth County. <coughs> Overdoses are happening every week in this county, maybe every day. The reason we don't hear about it is because not everyone who ODs dies. A lot of users are being brought back with Narcan, not just by rescue squad members, but by friends. Sometimes people in a group will assign somebody to stay just a little bit more sober <coughs> than Narcan ready, so that when somebody stops breathing while getting high, they can hit them with a shot and bring them back. Narcan is easily available, just like syringes are easily available at Neoclinics. In my over 10 years of life, <coughs> I've been to more overdose deaths than I can remember in this county, at least a dozen. I've worked two overdose deaths 
this year in this county. And I'm just one guy with the badge and a gun. I only work one shift. There are hundreds of cops in this county, so you can imagine how many of these calls we have. There are some people who don't like the work we do. There are some people who say that we only lock up addicts, but it's not the case. We've locked up plenty of dealers who are only in this for profit. This drug is colorblind. It does not discriminate based on skin color. The only color that matters in the heroin trade is green. Dealers are getting rich on the backs of addicts. They do not care about the lives they're destroying. As a matter of fact, recently I was buying heroin from a dealer who was only in it for profit. In between buys, I went a week or two without talking to him because we're busy in the drug unit. When I made contact with him again, he wanted to know why. He wanted to know where I had been. So I told him I had to lay low for a while because a girl I had helped out with his stuff had overdosed. He laughed. He laughed and said that I needed to step on it more because his shit was too good. Plenty of people we work up cases on and charge with deliveries tell us they're not drug dealers. They're only sharing with friends. Sharing with a friend is dealing. Addicts who deal will help friends out to make a few bucks in order for them to pick up more heroin. They will step on it or cut it, um, what they picked up, and then give it to their addict friend. Because they want to get more heroin, and they know what it's like to be dope sick. I'm not going to stand up here and pretend like I know what it's like to be dope sick, because I don't. Uh, anybody here in drug court, I applaud you. I can't pretend to understand how difficult it is uh, to overcome it. But I've talked to dozens of people who, who have gone through most of the addicts I talk to about it, they say it's just about the same. It feels like the worst flu ever. You feel like you're going to die. Your whole body aches. It's hard to even talk without throwing up. And you're almost guaranteed to shit your pants more than a few times. You can feel better if you use just a little. But then there you go back down that rabbit hole. The problem is it only takes a little to kill you. Tonight, when you go home, take a salt shaker and tap just a little bit out in your palm. If the heroin you're doing is raw or close to it, that much can kill you. Sniff it, bang it, whatever. Like the detective said before, to addicts, there's different levels of this addiction. We've talked to plenty of people here in Walworth County who say, I only sniff it, I would, I would never bang it. Are you, are you crazy? Do you think I'm nuts? It's a different level for those who uh, use the needle. We're following up on tips and working cases as I stand here in the drug unit in which we have credible information dealers in Walworth County are trying to find a way into our high schools in order to make addicts. These high schools, no exaggeration, that's, that's just fact. If you're here tonight because you're concerned for someone in your life, I would encourage you to look for the signs. No two addicts are the same. But you may see your loved ones sleeping throughout the day, withdrawing from all outside activities, giving up things they used to absolutely love, selling property, wearing long sleeves all times uh, to cover their track marks. The arms aren't the only place, though. Uh, you have to check their feet, too, in between their toes. You have met heroin addicts who shoot into their own necks. You may see spoons around with black marks on them from char. The little tea lights that, that have the little candles in them. You see those empty tea light holders laying around. Those are cookers. They use them for cookers. You may see the little clear Ziploc bags, little bit one inch by one inch. Those are called gem bags. Ziploc bags or sandwich bags with the corners cut off. Needle users. We use the tiny little cotton balls, I'm talking like smaller than the head of an eraser, to filter the liquid uh, through so as not to suck up the char or, or any pieces that can cook through. There's no reason to have any of that stuff that I just mentioned other than to bag up dope and use it. No 
reason to have them. Some people say drug overdoses are victimless crimes. There is no victim because the dead person chose to get high. That's what they get for rolling the dice. Disagree. This is not a victimless crime. Every heroin addict who dies has a family. A lot have children. Those that have tried to support them and get them out of the addiction become victims. Trust me, these children are victims. Many times in this county, I've seen children living in disgusting, filthy squalor while their parents sleep the day away. I've seen children sleeping in beds with uncapped, dirty, bloody needles scattered around the room in the mattress. I've seen parents put locks on the outside of their kids' bedroom doors so if those kids can't get out, it won't bother them when they're shooting drugs. Kids are observant, and they are way smarter than we give them credit for. Mommy's just sleepy. Daddy's just tired. How many times can a child hear that before they give up asking for help or asking for attention? For addicts with children, it's only a matter of time, maybe only a matter of days, before that child tries to wake up their parent and finds them cold to the touch, not breathing and stiff. This is not some fad drug that we can just cross our fingers and hope it goes out of style. It's here to stay and it's only getting started. We need to buckle up. It's vital we as a community take action. We cannot turn a blind eye to this plague. It's going to take all of us, law enforcement, prosecutors, judges, addiction counselors, parents, siblings, friends, even the addicts themselves. People are dying in this county. Soon there's going to be an ambulance down the street loading up the neighbor kid with a high school athlete at Delavan Darien High School who just wanted to try at a party. With all my heart, I hate heroin. I do not know a single law enforcement officer who wants to do CPR on an overdosed dead addict while their family stands behind them, behind us, praying and hoping that we can bring them back. I hate heroin, but in a few minutes, when the summit is done, I might try to buy some heroin in the parking lot. Please don't look away. Our so next speaker tonight is Travis Schwantes. He's a public defender here in Walworth County. He's going to tell us a little bit about his experiences with his clients who struggle with addiction. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Travis Schwantes. I'm a lawyer in the public defender's office. We represent people that get arrested for crime in the county. We probably handle about 60-70% of all the criminal cases in this county. And I just have to say right now that I'm still shaking a little bit after hearing speech. Um, that was so wonderful. Uh, that was such a well put talk. I, I've seen uh, on video recordings. As a defense attorney, when a client is arrested, they often are interrogated, uh, and it's recorded, and then I get to watch it. And I've seen uh, deputy work, I've seen his colleagues work, and the one thing that I can't deny, or, or one thing that overwhelmingly comes clear is how much they care. And, District Attorney Nisi kicked off this summit in much the same way. And I spend a lot of my days 
uh, disagreeing and fighting against Dan uh, and his staff. I think Haley Reed is here also. Uh, and uh, that's, that's the nature of our job. Um, but I have a confession to make, and it's I absolutely agree uh, with what District Attorney Macy said in his speech. And I absolutely wish I had a recording of a deputy talk so I could show my clients and I could show them how much really important people in this community care about this issue. Um, when Attorney Nacy talked about the roofer that he represented when he was in private practice, I know exactly the kind of people he's talking about. You know, he's talking about people, our neighbors, people that we know, people that didn't ask to fall off a roof and, and uh, suffer that pain. Uh, the football player who's injured, uh, the person in a traffic accident that's prescribed or overprescribed prescription medication. Um, I meet them when they're in jail, maybe shortly after they spoke to them. Okay, one client in particular. And that client wanted nothing more in the interview with uh, than to get out of jail that night. She was just arrested and she wanted to do whatever she could to get out of jail. And uh, he and his, uh, the person working with him asked why. And she was honest and said, I, I, I can't suffer the withdrawals. I can't have the dope sickness while I'm sitting here in the morning coming to jail. And uh, I think the officers did the compassionate thing and made sure she didn't get out of jail that night. So as a defense attorney that you know, everybody thinks we're, we're here trying to get people off, I guess that's part of the job. We're trying to make sure that if they're guilty, that the states put their burden of proof. But I think in a lot of other cases, the issue isn't guilt or innocence. Uh, law enforcement does a very good job of building strong cases. Um, Dan is absolutely right about that. And so a lot of times we're sitting there talking about what's the right thing to happen with this case that you can prove? What's the right thing for our community? What is the thing that makes us safer? What is the thing that ends the cycle of addiction? What is the thing that once this person goes through the system, they're able to come back to the community and not steal from you, not take your stuff and turn it into drugs. And one of the real positive things uh, in the last year or so is the development of our drug court. And there's two real good things about it, is we didn't make drug court up just out of thin air. We took studies that showed that a treatment-oriented approach where people are held accountable is a better investment of money. You reduce recidivism without spending as much money as you would spend in the old mode of handling these cases, which is quite often used to be just locking people up. Then they get out of jail, and Dan referenced that person that died of an overdose as soon as they got out of jail. So the first good thing about drug court is saves money and you get better bang for your buck. But the second thing is something uh, that I think deserves highlighting here because we just saw it here tonight. And that's the thing that, it's kind of a cliche that at the courthouse you only ever see two things that are good news and that's when there's a marriage performed at the courthouse and when there's an adoption performed at the courthouse. Everything else is bad, bad news. Criminal cases, people fighting over money, nothing good about it. Drug court, you get to see people being successful. And that's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing for me, who can get burnt out from time to time at seeing all this turmoil and sadness and just devastation on all sides. My clients, the victims, everything. Tonight, we got to see someone in her drug court find out that she got into college. That's just one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. And I'm really proud of everybody in our drug court team. Katie Bale is the coordinator, Dan Nisi, Department of Corrections, uh, Clerk of Courts, 
uh, human services, law enforcement, Judge Reddy. Uh, it's really a great thing, and I'm really glad that you got to see that all tonight. Thank you for being here. Folks, before I introduce our next speaker, I want to mention two things that I thought of while I was listening to the presenters tonight. One is I know uh, Sheriff Picknell wanted me to mention that he has uh, put a uh, pill and prescription drug depository in the lobby of the sheriff's office. If you have additional pills uh, that are just sitting around your house, not only are they a target for addicts, uh, they're potentially dangerous for people who visit, that sort of thing, they can be dropped off. Uh, at the sheriff's office. They've also been placed at the Fontana Police Department, the Whitewater Police Department, and I believe one more that's slipping my mind. But I wanted to mention that tonight. I also wanted to mention when we're talking about overdose deaths, and Chris did a great job talking about the number of overdose deaths, but he can only reference his own county. Uh, I, th I think of yesterday, I got a phone call. And that phone call was, there were three deaths over Memorial Day weekend in Lynn Township. Little, quiet Lynn Township. Farms and the south shore of Lake Geneva. Two of them were drug overdoses. That's just Memorial Day weekend 2015 in Walworth County. Our next speaker is Nicole Heinrich from the Department of Health and Human Services. She treats drug addicts. She takes on the challenge of trying to help people turn their lives around and uh, she's gonna tell us a little bit about that. Good evening, everyone. I know this has been a, a long talk, but a very much needed one. And um, I am too in awe of all of our speakers here. And just really, I kept making a list of important things that I wanted to make sure we highlighted on. And they just keep hitting everyone. So really what I want to talk about today is our treatment course. People ask a lot how this works or, or what makes this different than regular treatment. What's interesting to me is everyone had always said, we just don't have treatment for the addicts. What I struggled with was, it's here. It's just really hard getting them to stay there. The hardest challenge is to get someone who is struggling with their own addiction to walk through the door. Walking through the door, in and of itself, one time is hard. Repeatedly doing it is sometimes impossible. What we do it as a treatment court is something that I'm so honored to be a part of. It's so amazing to think of all these people sitting down at the table with all the same common goal. It is truly, Amazing to sit with the, with the DA, with the district, with um, the attorney, with probation and parole, with everyone there all trying to do the same thing, and that's to help one individual at a time to make a change to their life. How we started off is when somebody comes to our office and they've been coming to either seek treatment on their own or through the treatment courts, we start off by having all of our counselors are duly certified in mental health and addiction treatment. We recognize that when somebody comes in for treatment, you're not just treating an addiction. If you peel back the layer of the onion, you're really seeing trauma that's occurred in their life. It's not always just as easy as, it it's not always just something where someone had an addiction because of a tooth pain or a back injury, although that does happen. Many of the people we see have suffered from abuse, from physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, and it's they're using those things to mask pain. We start by taking a look at that as a whole. We treat that together. When we work together as treatment in, the, in, the, in the treatment courts, we look at it non-adversarial. We are non-judgmental towards, towards our consumers. There's a lot of passion that comes from the, pe the players involved. Sometimes it always doesn't seem fair, but we always recognize that fair is an equal. But what we do is we try to treat everyone as an individual and what their needs are. We try to work with them on an individual basis in therapy group treatment, we have family treatment, we have psychiatric services that try to treat those underlying mental health disorders that may have gone untreated for many years or undiagnosed because of being masked by their drug use. Some of the biggest challenges are working with how to change those thought patterns. There's an addictive thought process that starts happening of how to get their next fix. Those addictions are so strong and so powerful that it's, it's as strong as the urge that want to eat when you're starving. Those are hard things that we're trying to deal with here. 
Other big challenges is working with people and identifying sober social supports. When you've gotten so far into your addiction, all the people around you and who you're working with are in addicts or struggling themselves with their own demons. Trying to get them to change that when they burn so many bridges, when they recognize that family members or friends have had to set those boundaries or shut the door because they just couldn't watch them suffer anymore. We as a community have to work together or being able to say, when we recognize that somebody's trying to make a change, how do we help them? How do we continue to help them grow and make those changes as we see it starting to happen? Another important thing to recognize that when somebody relapses, it's not personal. They're not doing it to hurt you or to make you suffer. In fact, whenever somebody comes into my office and they say, I want to stop, I believe them 100% in that moment they do want to stop. It is strong, though, and every moment is a challenge for them. A relapse is something that we shouldn't shut the door on and say, oh, forget it, they don't want to try. What we're saying is, no, get them back. We're going to try again. A lot of people here tonight are coming because they're interested themselves, too, of how do you help others. It's a challenge. I mean, the best, best treatment is prevention. Doing what you can at your home. But when somebody has slipped into the pattern of addiction, sometimes it's really important just to get help yourself on how to cope with it. How you handle it as a supportive person is different for each and every person. It's what you can live with because we don't really know the outcome for the person who's struggling. However, I do want you to know that we do have, for our Health and Human Services, we have a 24-hour crisis hotline, as well as walk-in services. We can help you brainstorm, we'll help you talk together. We offer services to anyone who's living here in Walworth County, and we'll provide information to anybody and everyone all over the state if you're interested. The biggest thing is don't give up and have hope. It's really, really important to have hope because if you give up, then the one person who might, might have made a change in their life might not have that chance. So I'm really, really proud of the people who have accepted the drug board and who have come through here and are working really hard on a day-to-day, hour-by-hour, minute-by-minute to stop these, uh, get through these challenges in life and make a change. So thank you. Next, folks, I'd like to ask Ray Welter to come up here. Ray is the father of a user in recovery and hopefully can give our parents some perspective as to what it's like to be in that position. Well, good evening, everyone. I've had a lot of notes that I've taken, and, and I think I'm going to just set them aside. I've, I've gotten educated. I wish that I would have sat in on a class like this a year ago. I have to admit that I'm pretty naive when it came to recognizing what all the telltale signs of a drug user are. And now that they've been pointed out to me and they're very clear, I recognize all the things that were around me that I didn't recognize either. They were there in plain sight, but I didn't understand what they were, didn't know what they were, and didn't want to believe what they were. And it's a really difficult thing when you raise children from infancy all the way up to adulthood, and all of a sudden you have to start raising them all over again. Weston was a special gift to us. We waited 12 years to have our second son when we were told we couldn't take up him. I made a pledge to my wife that I would be home, not away on sales calls, and be active in his life in a way that I wasn't with our first son.
He had all the right work that ethics. All the neighbors wanted to borrow him to mow lawn. He did all the right things. He was all conference linebacker his senior year and had a bright future. Uh, didn't have any problems that I knew of until he blew out a knee and opened the door to painkillers. Very subtle. Not recognizable problem from a parent's standpoint. I see now that it was, but wasn't aware of what opiates were. Uh, that's a term I've become very familiar with. Any parents that are here tonight that are learning what we were taught tonight and shown, I think you're two, two steps ahead of where I was. Maybe avoid the difficulties that our families had to go through um, during the last uh, year's time. Less than was on here for a length of time, unbeknownst to us, and then decided on his own that he didn't like who he was. <clears throat> he stopped taking. <clears throat> up his act, but it was short-lived. He <clears throat> got in an argument with a girlfriend and decided that he needed to cover up the pain, and he went back <clears throat> and dose that he was comfortable taking previously, and it almost killed him. He was found in a parking lot in Whitewater, unresponsive, and rushed where we received a phone call at 2.30 a.m. stating that he had been arrested for heroin use, that he was in stable condition, and he was all right. But uh, from that moment on, our life has been totally different. Heroin has became a household term, and we were forced into a situation that we were totally unprepared for, but not unwilling to do. Because you see, I made a commitment to do whatever I needed to do to raise Weston when he was a baby, and that commitment was still there. And when that phone call came through, it was, what do I need to do? And I'll do whatever it has, whatever I have to do to make sure Weston is taken care of and that we get him the help that he needs. So priority one was health. We gotta make sure that he is healthy. So we knew we needed to get treatment, but we also knew that he needed legal advice. And thank goodness that I got contact with the right player who his priorities were Weston's health as well. And he put me under direction to get in touch with healthcare person, it was Rogers, and we immediately got him into the closest opening, which was in Brown Deer. And we drove Weston for six weeks to class and back, starting in February. We get him home at 1139. I worked at the University of Whitewater, and I had to plow snow at 2.30 in the morning on occasion. Sleep deprivation was pretty high on my list of drawbacks at the time, but the priority one was to get Weston the help that he needed, and we made sure that we did that. Between my wife, my oldest son, and myself, we got Weston in class and got him stabilized, and in the meantime, got him to a condo walk where we were traveling two and a half hours each day to get him to class. He is scheduled to graduate from class this very week. But he will finish his therapy and on the road to recovery. And hopefully we can keep 
heroin at arm's length and not have to go through this tragic reoccurrence. He shows all the right signs. And he does all the right things, but I know now that it's it's just a blink and everything can go back to the game. Uh, I'm just really naive when it comes to how how gripping something like this must be. I can't conceive doing anything that would jeopardize my health, my family, my livelihood, my ability to recreate and do things that I enjoy by taking something like this. It's beyond my comprehension. I don't understand it, but I have to do it. And I'm going to do whatever I can be it. And I just thank you for the opportunity to share with you folks tonight. And I hope that learned here to give you a way to some of the situations so you don't have to go through what we went through. It's, it's heart wrenching. <laughs> Folks, for our last speaker tonight, I'd like to ask uh, Craig Steltenpole to come up here. He's also a father of a recovering addict who's also a, uh, a participant in the Walworth County Drug Court. I've said this one other time, and it was in a program presentation um, in public. I'm Craig. I am the father of a recovering heroin addict. <sighs> I guess uh, the reason I'm here is because we're, we're trying to give you a little bit of uh, background into what the family has gone through over the past eight years with my son. This is how long we've been back. Uh, we knew something was wrong, we knew he was into something, could never figure out what was. Until we got a phone call from my son in the Cook County Jail, and uh, found out he'd been arrested for possession of heroin, and you could have knocked me over with a feather. I never imagined that my son would have ever gotten involved with that. How do you even buy it? Well, I found out that it's a whole lot easier than I thought. After his arrest, he was transferred up into uh, Wisconsin. Never had to do any real jail time. Tried to beat it on his own. We looked for help. I spent days on the phone trying to get him help and we aren't financially able to do the fancy uh, rehab programs that cost fifteen to thirty thousand dollars a month or more that was out of reach if I had it I would have gladly spent it I'm just a carpenter We thought he was doing pretty well. We thought he was, he was, he was using marijuana. We knew that. We couldn't break him of it. He just, he was of the mindset that it was, hey, Dad, it's just dope. It's no big deal. No matter how much you talk to him about it. Um, then last September happened. And things had been going downhill pretty well. Uh, we got a phone call from his girlfriend. What's going on with Will? I have no idea what's going on with Will. Well, he borrowed my car. He got a phone, a phone call from the sheriff's department. Uh, 
my car's all smashed up on Highway 50. I don't know what's going on. Evidently, Will is in jail. Well, he couldn't use it again. He got in a car accident on Highway 50, which is just her car, thank God. He crossed the median, went into the opposite lane, and took out the side. How he didn't take out somebody else, I have no idea. <clears throat> he had burned every bridge with everybody in the family. Just absolutely destroyed it. The day he was arrested last September, he basically threw his brother under the bus and tried to say that he was his brother when he was arrested. When his girlfriend called uh, the sheriff's department to find out what was going on, he uh, She asked for uh, my son, Will, and they said, no, he's not here, but so-and-so is here. I'm not gonna use my other son's name. Uh, and she said, no, no, you got Will. That's not, you, you're, he's using his brother's name. And the officer said, well, that makes a lot of sense now. And they started putting the picture together. This part is getting hard. <laughs> I truly didn't feel that there was anything that anybody would ever be able to do to fix the relationship between my son, my two sons that had been so seriously damaged. But God can change things with prayer. And my wife and I had, had gone into Milwaukee to see a concert and it just so happened that my other son had moved home I didn't know how it was going to work with the two of them living there because my youngest one was pretty much ready to kill my, my oldest one. Uh, but I, we got home that night and my ma, coincidentally, had fallen and broken her arms and she was living with us for about eight weeks. And uh, when we walked at the door, My ma said that uh, <clears throat> the two boys sat at the kitchen table and they talked things out for three hours. And it was this time. <clears throat> the life changing event for us, though, was definitely last September when they started talking to him after he was arrested about this new program called the Drug Court. We had absolutely no way to offer the kind of uh, rehabilitation that these people are offering. This Drug Court program is a gift from God for this country. You have no idea how grateful we are. And uh, I was grateful to the point <clears throat> where I had asked the judge, uh, you know, if I could do a little something to get back. And he, uh, this is what happens when you ask a judge. <laughs> anyway. Um, Drug court is not easy. They're monitored quite closely. Uh, 
there's a lot of classes, there's a lot of running. It takes a tremendous amount of family support for these guys, these guys and gals to, to be able to be successful at this program. My wife, bless her heart, she puts on more miles than we. Not so much now because thankfully Will has entered phase three of the program and there's not near as much running. But most of these people don't have a driver's license. They need somebody to get them to where they're going, to where they have to go. They don't have a choice, they have to be there. Whether it's a UA three, four, five times a week, or, or counseling, or PO, or whatever, it takes a tremendous amount of family support. <clears throat> We've tried to, to split it up as best we can, but I work during the day. Uh, thankfully, during the school year, my wife is able to do the running and stuff in the morning. Um, It's, it's a program that basically we had no hope, really, truly, of finding a way to get my son sober. And because of Walworth County Drug Court Program, my son has been sober for nine months. And that's basically <laughs> And I'm very proud of him, and I know how hard he's worked. And I just, I just don't know how to thank all you people for the work that you put into this program. It, it, it is truly a gift, and the work you're doing is good. And you're going to have some setbacks, and there's going to be people that are going to have some positive tests every once in a while and don't take it personally. Continue the program. You're saving lives. You truly are. This is a drug that, as people have said here tonight, crosses every class line. It doesn't make any difference how much money you have or how much money you don't have. I, I personally know of a gentleman who the first time my son was arrested heard me talking on the telephone one day when I was over at his house working on a project and I was trying to get help for my son. And he came up to me and he said, I don't mean to sound like I was eavesdropping, he said, but I am going through the exact same thing with my son right now. And just to be able to talk to somebody that knew what I was going through was fantastic. Because, you know, and number one, it's a stigma you don't want to, you don't want to talk to people about that. You carry that burden around. And but this gentleman made me Ten times more than a year than I'm going to make in a lifetime. That was the difference between him and I. And there's people probably sitting here in the audience today that whether you know it or not, you know somebody who's dealing with this. It's out there. And there's people sitting out here thinking, there's no way that this would ever happen to me. Eight years ago, I was you. I never figured that my son would ever become a heroin addict, but he did. My son, I guess the most important thing that my son has learned right now is he, has, he had to change people that he was hanging around with and he 
He had to get rid of the friends that he had, and it's time to make new friends and move on in a positive direction. We couldn't make him see that, but through the help of the drug court program, that's finally becoming clear to him. He's also got two other friends that were involved in this. One of them did five years in prison. Um, it's, it's just a nasty thing, and it gets a hold of them. And without this drug court program, quite frankly, there's not a lot of people that wouldn't have any hope. They just keep going the way they are, trying to get through life. It got so bad for my wife and I at one point, and, and this is going to sound callous or non-caring, but the conversation one time turned to, well, maybe if he did OD, he'd be better off, at least he'd be at peace. That's a father and a mother talking between themselves about their child, because that's how hopeless we are. This drug court program, and I've said it before, gives us hope. And you have no idea what that means to us. Thank you. Folks, I hope in your time tonight you've gained some insight some knowledge you can put to work, some things you can think about. Please don't hesitate to contact anyone you've seen here tonight. I think I can say unequivocally that we're all ready and able to talk. And also be thinking about how you or someone you know can get involved in this fight in a different way, maybe one we haven't thought of yet. The more minds together on this, the more resources brought to bear, the faster we can achieve success. We'll all be here for a while for some questions. Also, do me a favor. This is being videotaped. We can reach a lot more people on the worldwide interweb in 2015 than we can cram it into an auditorium. Look for this video online. When you see it, share it, send it to your friends, send it out there. This is a message that has to get out. Again, thank you to Delavan Darien High School for graciously allowing the space and for all of you for attending tonight. May God bless you, and may God continue to bless Walworth County. Thank you.